I am on a journey, a journey to live like Jesus lived and to love like Jesus loved, to teach like he taught and to believe what he believed. Every day, with every breath that I take, I strive to be more like he was, a man who cared for the lost, who healed the sick, who forgave those who wronged him. I am not perfect, but Jesus is. And as a follower of Jesus, my desire is to represent him in the best way that I can, in my home, in my workplace, and in my city. He was, so I am, a servant. He was, so I am, a source of healing. He was, so I am, forgiving. He was, so I am, obedient. He was, so I am, compassionate. That's who he was, so that's who I want to be. It was the final exam for a college course, and the exam counted as 75% of the grade. It was five minutes before the time was up, and the professor gave a very strict warning. He said, there are five minutes left. When I say put your pencils down, you must do it, or you're going to immediately be failed. So then he gave the one minute warning, and then counted down from 10 seconds, and then finally got three, two, one. Okay, put your pencils down and bring your finished exams forward. Well, as the rest of the class followed the instructions, bringing their exams up one by one, one student kept furiously writing in an attempt to finish the exam. The professor shouted at him, hey, you, I told you to put that pencil down. That's it, you're gonna get a zero on this exam. Well, after the rest of the students had piled their papers on the professor's desk, the student walked slowly forward and he said to the professor, do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? And the professor said, no, I have no idea who you are and I don't care. And the student said, good. And then he stuffed his exam into the middle of the pile and walked out the back of the auditorium. When Jesus walked the earth, he had many moments like that, I'm sure. Although Jesus' attitude was a little different than the attitude of that student. Jesus had similar moments where he looked across at an angry face and he asked, do you know who I am? One day, because Jesus had healed a man on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders were furious with him. He made them even angrier when he called God his own father, making himself equal with God. Well, in response to their anger, Jesus laid down a truth about himself, a truth that we're gonna get digging into for a few moments today, a truth about Jesus that we're gonna actually apply to ourselves as his followers. Now, the Gospel of John tells us that in response to their anger over his claims, Jesus gave them this answer. He said, very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son also does. Now, I encourage you in your Bible, or if you have an outline, to underline the words only do in that verse. Only do. Have you done that? Okay. Let's skip a little further to the eighth chapter in John's Gospel, to another debate with another gang of angry people, angry over the claims Jesus was making about himself. Now, John records that Jesus looked at them and said, The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Again, I want you to underline a phrase in that verse. This time, underline the words, always do. Now, there you go. Two declarations from the lips of Jesus. Two statements about the quality of his life. According to Jesus himself, he only did and always did the will of the Father. Simply stated, Jesus was obedient. We claim to be his followers. So what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? To follow Jesus means to believe what Jesus believed, to teach what Jesus taught, to love like Jesus loved, and to live like Jesus lived. Well, we just learned that Jesus was obedient. Well, if Jesus was obedient, that means that I am to be obedient as well. So, okay, what does that look like? The most common word in the New Testament translated obey or obedience is the ancient Greek word hupakuo. Everybody say hupakuo. 
It's a combination of two Greek words joined together to form one Greek word. Hupo, which means under, it's where we get our word hypodermic, like a hypodermic needle goes under the skin. And then the word akuo, which means to listen to, it's where we get our word acoustic. Hupakuo, it literally means to listen under. So it means to submit or to obey. Now the problem that many of us have with obedience is we have a bit of a warped view when it comes to this word. We tend to think of obedience as doing something that we're forced to do. Or we think of obedience as being forced to act against our will. It's something that we do because we're afraid we're going to be punished if we don't do it. It's the classic gun to your head scenario. In other words, if you can think a robber comes and they ha have a gun and they'll put it to your back or put it to your head and you're not going to give them all your money unless they force you to with a gun to your back or your head. You're not going to give up your car unless they force you to with a gun to your back or a gun to your head. That's a form of obedience. That is a version of obedience, but that's not the biblical version of obedience. That is not the kind of obedience that Jesus experienced. So neither should it be the kind of obedience that his followers should experience either. This gun to your head kind of obedience is not biblical obedience. Biblical obedience isn't a gun to your head. It's more a history of your heart. Now you say, what is history of your heart kind of obedience? What does that even mean? Well, history of your heart obedience is joyful and willing obedience. It's the result of what you have experienced in your past. It's obedience that's born out of historically positive interactions. Think in these terms. You have a financial advisor. She has been your financial advisor for 30 years. Now, for all of those years, she has wisely stewarded your resources to the point where you are in solid financial shape as your retirement draws near. She phones you on Monday and she recommends that you sell a certain stock and shift a certain portfolio around. So how do you respond? I imagine that most would obey. Okay, but with which kind of obedience would you obey? Would it be with the gun to your head kind of obedience or would it be with the history of your heart kind of obedience? I imagine it would be the second kind of obedience. The obedience born out of a history of positive interactions. That's the kind of obedience that Jesus experienced with his father. And that's the kind of obedience that his followers are called to experience as well. Now this dynamic is subtly displayed in how this Greek word for obey is used in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 12 verse 13, we read the following. It says, it's actually quite an unremarkable verse actually. It says, Peter knocked at the outer entrance and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. Peter knocked at the outer entrance and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. In that verse, you actually find the word hupakuo, the Greek word for obey. You say, where is the word obey in that sentence? He goes to the door and she, you know, Peter knocks at the door and the woman goes to answer it. Where's hupakuo? Where's obey in there? It's hidden behind the word answer. The word translated answer in that verse is the Greek word for obey. You say, well, what's the connection between answer and obey? This verse gives us the fuller sense of what that word means. Hupakuo is what a faithful servant does when they trust a voice. They answer it. They obey it. Now this distinction between gun to your head obedience and history of your heart obedience is crucial for us to understand. So that's why it's going to stand as our big idea today. Biblical obedience is not fear-based. It's, it's a biblical obedience is, is love and trust based. In fact, here's the big idea. Obedience is what happens when love meets trust. Obedience is what happens when love meets trust. When love meets trust, obedience is produced. When love meets trust, obedience flows naturally. It's what Jesus did, and it's what every follower of Jesus is called to do. He was, so I am, obedient. An obedience that is produced when love meets trust. Okay. So now that we've laid some important groundwork, let's actually build upon that. 
And I first want to build upon it by dismantling another false concept when it comes to obedience. And that's this. Obedience is not how we access God's presence. Many, many years ago, I dealt with a family that was riddled with dysfunction. The dysfunction was really rooted in a father who played his children off against one another. Whichever child treated him best on any given day was shown affection that day. And whenever a child failed or faltered or stumbled, they would be shunned. Sadly, that seems to be how we tend to think our Heavenly Father treats us at times. We tend to think that as long as we're doing good things, as long as we're doing what our Father wants, He's going to be happy and He'll love us and He'll treat us well. But if we falter, if we stumble, if we disobey, then He shuns us, He turns His back on us. Folks, nothing could be further from the truth. The people in the church in the ancient region of Galatia fell into this trap of false thinking. The Apostle Paul had given them a solid foundation. They heard and they believed the message of Jesus Christ. They heard and they believed the good news of Jesus Christ. The good news is the simple truth that, that we had been separated from God by our sin. So he came and took on the form of humanity and the person, Jesus of Nazareth. And he then paid our moral debt. He paid the price of our sin. And he then reestablished our relationship with God, not based upon what we have done, but based upon what he did in our behalf. In fact, the Bible says God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were disobedient, Christ died for us. That's the good news. That's the message of the gospel of Jesus. That's the message that he preached to Galatia. Now, the problem with the Galatians was after starting outright, they began to wobble. They began to believe and teach a false gospel. They began to believe and teach that we start with belief in Jesus. Yeah, but then we have to finish it with our own good deeds. They would say, Jesus opens the door, but it's our obedience that actually gets us into the presence of God. When Paul heard about this, he was furious. He wrote them a scathing letter. Listen to how the message paraphrase communicates Paul's original words from Galatians. He says, you crazy Galatians, did someone put a hex on you? Have you taken leave of your senses? Something crazy has happened, for it's obvious that you no longer have the crucified Jesus in clear focus in your lives. His sacrifice on the cross was certainly set before you clearly enough. He says, I preached clearly. Let me put this question to you. How did your new life begin? Was it by working your heads off to please God? Or was it by responding to God's message to you? Are you going to continue this craziness? For only crazy people would think that they could complete by their own efforts what was begun by God. If you weren't smart enough or strong enough to begin it, how do you suppose you could perfect it or complete it? Did you go through this whole painful learning process for nothing? It's not yet a total loss, but it certainly will be if you keep this up. Answer this question for me, Galatians. Does the God who lavishly provides you with his own presence, his Holy Spirit, working things in your lives that you could never do for yourselves, does he do these things because of your strenuous moral striving or because you trust him to do them in you? Don't these things happen among you just as they happened with Abraham? Now remember, he believed God, and that act of belief was turned into a life that was right with God. Paul could not have been any clearer, and we need to listen to his words today. Yes, Jesus was obedient, and yes, I am called to be obedient as well. But obedience is not how I access God's presence. So how do I access God's presence, you ask? In another letter to the church in the ancient city of Ephesus, Paul put it this way. He says, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. It's not by works, so no one can boast. So again, Paul is emphasizing salvation, eternal life is a free gift purchased by Jesus on your behalf. It's a gift we receive. It's not a, a something, a, a work or a, something that we merit or work for. It's a gift we receive. Okay then. So far, we've learned that obedience is not how we access God's presence. God's presence is accessed through accepting, trusting, and receiving the free gift of God's grace as purchased by Jesus Christ. 
Now we've also learned that biblical obedience is not the result of a gun to your head, but a history of your heart. Obedience is what happens when love meets trust. Now with that as our foundation, let's quickly fill in further some blanks that should go a long way towards helping us live like Jesus lived in this area. Let's quickly highlight three key truths about what biblical obedience is. Now listen carefully to what Jesus said when it came to obedience. I'm quoting Jesus now. He said, if you love me, keep my commands. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. Now look what Jesus just did there. He linked love for him with obedience to him. If you love me, keep my commands. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. Now, get this, this has nothing to do with earning his love. Don't slip into the old thinking. Jesus did not say, if you want me to love you, keep my commands. He didn't say that. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Jesus is saying that obedience is how we express a grateful heart. Obedience answers the question, Jesus, what can I do to express to you my absolute thankfulness for all that you've done for me? Jesus, how can I ever tell you and show you how much I love and appreciate you? Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commands. The Apostle John put it this way in a letter he wrote. John said, if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him or we are in relationship with him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. John taught that when we obey God, we are allowing love to finish its work within us. That's what John is teaching when he writes, if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in him. According to John, obedience is love at work within you. Jesus was, so I am obedient. Why? Not because I earn God's love through my obedience, no. Instead, I obey God because obedience is how I express a grateful heart. But there's another reason why we obey God as followers of Jesus. It's also because obedience is how we experience a better life. Now, when I was a kid, I used to watch the show, Let's Make a Deal. Let's Make a Deal is known for its audience members who dress in outrageous costumes in order to increase their chances of being selected as a contestant. Members of the audience are selected and then they're given the opportunity to make a deal with the host. So what'll happen is the contestant will uh, have something of value placed in their hands and then they're given a choice. Do you want to keep what we put in your hands or do you want to exchange it for another item? But the catch is that the other item is always hidden from the contestant until their choice is made. So the contestant doesn't know if they're getting something of equal value to what's in their hands, something of greater value to what they hold in their hands, or if they're getting a dud, something that is completely useless, of little or no value. That dynamic is the source of the tension and the entertainment on the show. So, Imagine, a contestant is called forward and they're given $500 in cash. Then the dealing begins. They're asked, do you want to keep that $500 or do you want to trade it for what's hidden behind door number two? Now, there might be a trip for two to Paris behind door number two. There might be a brand new car behind door number two. Or there might be a donkey behind door number two. The contestant has to decide. Do I keep the cash that I have in my hand or do I exchange it for the unknown, for what I can't see? Many of us subconsciously treat obedience to God like we're playing let's make a deal. We're afraid to exchange the life that we have in our hands for the unknown life that God is offering us behind door number two. Hear me, obey him. God is not playing games with you. God loves you, he created you, he designed you, he knows and he wants what is best for you. Obey him. Obedience is what happens when love meets trust. Obedience is not risking your life. Obedience is how you experience a better life. 
speaking to his people, God declared this through the prophet Jeremiah. He said, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Hear me. God doesn't have a donkey behind the door number two in your life. He loves you. You can trust him. So you should obey him. Obedience is how you will experience a better life. Okay, let's quickly touch on one last insight before we conclude. And this final insight should go a long way towards avoiding the mistake that the Galatians made. Remember, we touched on it a little earlier in today's teaching. You see, if we stopped here, The temptation might be to walk away and think, okay, Darren, yeah, obedience is good. That's what I've learned. And that means that I really need to work really, really hard. I'm going to work really hard on being a better Christ follower. I'm going to try even harder to pray more and to read the Bible more. And I'm always going to try to do the right thing. Now, don't get me wrong. Those are all noble goals. It's not the destination that I want to warn you about. It's the vehicle that you think will take you to that destination that I want to warn you about. See, the obedience that we're talking about today is not sourced within ourselves. Biblical obedience is not the product of our own willpower. Obedience is the product of God's indwelling spirit. Listen to what the Apostle Paul declared. He said this, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. That's Philippians 2.13. It's God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Now in your Bibles or on your outline, underline it is God. God. And the word works. I believe in the original Greek that's the word energio. It's where we get our word energy. It's God who is energizing within you. To do what? Well then underline the words will and act. God himself, by his indwelling spirit, is energizing within you to will and to act to fulfill his purposes in your life, to live the life that he's designed for you to live. In his letter to the church in ancient Rome, Paul said this. He says that he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Paul is reminding them that the indwelling Spirit of God is always at work within us. He's searching our hearts, working within our hearts and upon our hearts, shaping, fueling, directing our hearts. The indwelling Spirit is even interceding for us on our behalf. He's always seeking to steer us towards God's design for our lives. Obedience is not the product of our own willpower. No, obedience is the product of God's indwelling spirit in our life. Our role is to cooperate with him by interacting with his written words, interacting with his indwelling spirit, interacting with his church, and then obeying what we read, what we hear, and what we sense. Well, let's conclude. Jesus was, so I am, obedient. It's how I express a grateful heart. It's how I experience a better life. It's the product of God's indwelling spirit. Jesus was, so I am, obedient. And I can do this because I know that he loves me and I know that I can trust him. I can do this because obedience is what happens when love meets trust. So what about you? Is there an area in your life when you know you're being disobedient an area in your life where you know you are resisting him. You're working against him. Maybe it's because you were afraid. You didn't know if you could trust him. Obedience is what happens when love meets trust. Listen, he loves you. You can trust him. Obey him. Or maybe you're watching, and if you're honest with yourself, you know that you are outright rejecting the will of God. You are deliberately disobeying. Well, obedience is what happened where love meets trust. So I need to ask you this question. If you were deliberately disobeying him, you need to ask yourself the question, do I really love him? Let's pray right now together. God, I thank you that you first loved us. And I thank you that you poured your love into our lives. You demonstrated your love for us and that while we were still sinners, you died for us. 
And even now your spirit is striving with us, working upon us, working within us to shape your image in our lives. For those of us who are knowingly disobeying, Lord, we repent. We don't want to live in disobedience to you. We focus once again on how much you have loved us and how much we love you in return. Forgive us. We don't want to live this way anymore. And for those of us who have been nervous and weren't sure if we could trust you, forgive us. We trust you. You have shown yourself to be trustworthy. And for those who are watching right now and you've not yet taken that initial step of accepting God's love and his mercy, the gift of his forgiveness into your life, right now I want to give you the opportunity to do that. Pray this prayer with me. God, I acknowledge that I've rebelled against you. I acknowledge that I have sinned, as the Bible calls it. I've missed the mark of your design for my life. I've fallen short of your design. I don't want to live this way anymore. I turn my back on that old way of living and I face your cross and your throne and your empty tomb and I welcome you into my life. Spirit of God, fill me. Change me from the inside out. And give me the courage to act on this decision even now before I walk away from this screen. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you just prayed that prayer with me, or maybe you would like someone to help you take the next step in your journey wherever you are in Christ, there's a number on the screen right now. Text it, and someone will respond to you and help in any way that they can. No, don't worry, you're not going to get a phone call. You're not going to be put on a mailing list. We'll simply respond to you, answer your questions, and help you in any way we can to take the next step in your journey towards Christ-centeredness. God bless you. Thank you for being with us at Broadway Church today.